Uh, today's topic is going to be psychedelics and music and uh, we're going to talk about uh, Gong's You, the album You. Uh, okay, this is quite a tricky one because it covers so much and uh, we are actually quite involved with the matter in, in, in different ways. And uh, I'm not sure my, my partners here have actually realized it, but our last album is pretty psychedelic, especially, well, talking about the lyrics, of course. Conceptually. Uh, conceptually, yeah. It's very, very psychedelic. And uh, I, uh, I haven't actually really explained it <laughs> to my friends here in, you know, in detail. And they asked me many times to do it, although, they, of course, they, they know that the general concept, we, we've conceived it quite, pretty much together, but uh, I've never, never gone fully into detail, so we were talking about it and realized that at some point uh, I'm gonna write something down, some kind of little essay about it, <coughs> because we don't want to be very cryptic, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so we, just we, we're, just talking, we're just talking about the fact that Lucky Cat's not. Um, what? It's not, not moving. Working, yeah. He's not doing what? He's not moving his hands. Oh, I yeah, just. <clears throat> so, yeah, sorted. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to talk about it in two different areas, I suppose. We're going to give you well, some kind of. The thing to start with is psychedelic music, effectively, was a genre that started in the 60s. Mm. Um, and came in the sixties, actually. That's what I just said. Oh, thought you said this. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm <laughs> listening to stuff, but thinking about something else, my brain is messing up. Amazing. Yeah. yeah good job. Um, but actually, you're still wrong. But it because it started in the fifties. True. Blues and jazz. Yeah, yeah. yeah jazz. That's, that's, jazz. But it it kind of came from either folk or blues. Yeah. Or jazz, and yeah. it's it's kind of a, in a way it's very similar to jazz in the fact that it's. It had a lot of improvisation, a lot of long, kind of extended solo sections and stuff, which is a very jazz kind of thing, but it kind of brought that into more uh, rock music and pop music, I suppose. So with, I mean, obviously some of the biggest exponents of it, like Jimi Hendrix, um, Jefferson Airplane, uh, who were some early ones, the Beatles, obviously. Yeah. Um, Even the, the Beach doors. Boys, yeah, yeah of Beach course. Boys. Yeah, everything pretty much, when it comes to rock, at least, psychedelic rock, everything pretty much started in <coughs> California with, uh, with San Francisco. San Francisco, yeah. Because uh, they had see. loads and loads of LSD. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're LSD talking about. LSD really to blame, let's <laughs> face it, right? When LSD really became big, I mean, mm. that was kind of it. Well, because it was legal originally. Yeah, it was it legal, was legal yeah. Became, became illegal in. 1966 mm -hmm. in, in the States and uh, in the UK and there's so much to say about it historically because uh, I don't know if we said that before but we are very we are big fans of the work of Timothy Leary and Alan Watts and Terence McKenna and a Aldous lot Huxley as well. Aldous Huxley and uh, these are basically together with the, the beat Riders, oh, Kerouac, yeah, and Ginsburg, Kerouac and, and yeah, uh, all these guys are responsible for inspiring so much research into it, it, it scientifically and, and also personally. Of well, course. and they were also part of the whole movement, of the whole psychedelic kind of movement of that time with with art, music, <coughs> literature, yeah, film, everything. Yeah, you know, yeah. you know, everything started with. I mean, when it, when it was in the blues movement was pretty much about heroin and very hard drugs and then moved uh, towards um, masculine and, and peyote and more shamanic kind of experiences mm -hmm. and uh, yeah uh, at the beginning LSD was was conceived as a as a means to to cure mental illness yeah, mm. turned out to do the exact opposite. Though. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know, right? Well, the, the jury's out because the thing is that a lot of um, <coughs> the kind of development within psychiatry kind of came from the, those roots of LSD research way back in 
60s, mm. early 60s, and, um, and late 50s. And, you know, uh, basically then it was kind of outlawed and went underground. And I think what really did it was, you know, Charles Manson. and, and that, Yeah, that was, that, that was a series of... of you know, Have you ever heard his album, by the way? No, I haven't. It's awful. <laughs> So well, uh, I mean, it's not surprised. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's not his surprising. interviews are quite cool, though. He's yeah, <laughs> just a complete maniac. It's yeah, it's a total lunatic. Anyway, yeah, during the 60s, it was pretty, you know, um, free in some ways. There, there, there was this group of people, I don't remember, they, they, they were called some pranksters, something, I don't remember it. And they had this thing called the psychedelic test. No, the acid uh, test. The acid test. Yeah. And they, they used to, yeah, to, to wander around <clears throat> in a van and having people try and LSD and, and listen to music and watch into images and, and, and light shows and, and take note of the, of the reactions and stuff. And there was a lot of, of academic research. And then what happened is, is that basically, you know, Timothy Leary started to make it very big and known and, and he, he went from treating it as 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 medication to actually a, a, a recreation a rec not exactly it, it, it moved towards the you know on the more humanistic area like to meta programming and yeah stuff. it was yeah yeah plus yeah there, there was quite a lot of <coughs> Robert Anton Wilson's another guy yeah of Robert Anton Wilson Robert Anton Wilson and Ram Dass is another one as well mm. yeah that were in that kind of area, of, but now we're kind of really talking about philosophers, and obviously along with that whole movement is the whole musical side yeah, exactly. of it, where you know it was kind of tied into it, wasn't it? Especially throughout throughout the sixties, the music you could really feel it, like when the Beatles. Um, well, like that period from like the just before the mid sixties to like seventy nine, that that entire period was just psychedelia, basically, like in art, in imagery, in music. Um, not entirely. Though. No, not entirely. I know, but that's when it that's when it peaked as a kind of at the forefront, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as a, as a, in, as a it, big scene in like pop culture. Yeah, yeah thing. exactly. Yeah, anyway, like Woodstock, you know, being kind of near the yeah. end of it. Mm -hmm. So but, during the sixties, a lot of bands in different areas and genres started to jump on the psychedelic wagon, bandwagon, and it spread in pop and and. He started going to the other side of the ocean, and it had its, its very big scene here in the UK, of course. Of course, one of the, of the first bands that come to mind are Pink Floyd, but also Cream or uh, King Crimson. Yeah, Soft Machine. And uh, and Gone, well, of in the Call of the Crimson King is a very psychedelic album, their first album. Yeah. But yeah, it's much more I mean, it's, a, it's kind of, I guess the thing is that there's a distinction in a way between what they were doing and what they're expressing and their kind of music and, um, and how it ties into the movement in terms of the drug usage, right? I don't mm. really think that they were no, no, in, no. The, in that scene, but they were certainly in the progressive, right at the forefront at the start mm. of the progressive scene. And we, we'll actually talk more about that when we come on to well, talk. Well, yeah, in a way, like the psychedelic movement was a kind of bridge. To, yeah, to the progressive. Thing, it started so many actually subgenres. It, it, it's been basically <coughs> the, the the seed for even heavy metal and yeah, progressive rock and glam rock and and hard rock. Mm -hmm. It has. Well, it's just kind of because it's yeah. The whole point is opening the boundaries and yeah. combined merging fusion yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. You know, fusion yeah, and styles. A lot of musicians that used to be in pretty in totally psychedelic bands started to, you know, get away from it and started new things like, you know, it, it, and there was quite a lot of, of recycling, you know, mm. like Bill Bruford com, com, comes to mind. Yeah, right, exactly. You know, went from, from Yes to Yeah, and to Bill Bruford, and, and, Gong, you're right, yeah. exactly, it was briefly in Gong, uh, King Crimson. Yeah, and so, King Crimson, yeah. Yeah, and, and you, you get a lot of the same names cropping up in these bands. And, yeah. and really, no, you're totally right. That at the end of the 60s, it was kind of a bridge through the psychedelia into, um, into progressive. Well, you can see it really strongly with Pink Floyd, actually, because their, their earlier yeah. albums, Pipes of the Gates of Dawn and um, Source Full of Secrets, are very mm. much psychedelic. <coughs> Probably mm. due to Sid Barrett's influence. <laughs> um, and then... 
Yeah, and then they, they Before he went a little bit too more, far. You know, what we really call progressive rock. Yeah, now. but the thing is, I never really, I mean, I never really class uh, or classify Pink Floyd as progressive rock, personally. I mean, I guess they are, but they don't have the elements that you would call um, or that you would associate with, like, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Yes, Rush, uh, you know, early Genesis. They have a lot more complex structures, fast moving, and um, there's certain, there's, and Gong as well, you know, the yeah, way that they. Definitely more. more bluesy. Yeah, like the early, mm. They're more bluesy. bluesy yeah. Mm. yeah. It seems like they're stuck to that. The roots, yeah. Anyway, uh, at some point, it started to to, to disappear for, for quite some reasons, and one of these reasons was the fact that, yeah, as Tom said, uh, there were some casualties. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sid Barrett was a big casualty. Sid Barrett, yeah, and um, Peter Green. Jim the... Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, and Janis Joplin. Janis Joplin, and quite yeah, some facts, like j- yeah. a girl getting stabbed at a... Uh, at the, I think at it the was Woodstock. Festival? Woodstock, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it started the the, the pub, public opinion and, and the government, of course, wanted to, mm. to keep everything under control and and they started being scared by it and of course the American uh, government mm-hmm. started experimenting with it to make damage like they always yeah, do, right. you know, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. They always try to use use everything <laughs> as a weapon. How can we make this as and negative means, as possible? And a means of control. <laughs> yeah, something that was supposed to be actually. Mm a means of liberation from, from the ego they were trying to turn it into a... It yeah, but I think, I think that there is a, like an intrinsic, to be honest with you, I think there is an intrinsic uh, negativity or uh, there's something that's not quite right for me in the whole movement in the 60s with this peace, love and everything's great and hippies well, no, know, no. where, where they, they just basically, oh, doesn't matter about anything and we'll yeah, go It's off just like a free It's like, okay, well, you know, <coughs> if you actually, <coughs> everyone lived in the way that you yeah, want to live, mess. it will be a mess. It's yeah, just because you've got the society there yeah, supporting yeah, exactly. you that... Yeah. You're, it's n- not all of these bands were, were actually related or, you know, to, to, to the hippie movement. It, it's kind of a general, generalization, you know what I mean? It's not mm. like all of them were hippies. Mm. Some of them were just researchers. Of, of <coughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I'm just saying in general that, that whole movement. Yeah. For me, and, and really, in a way, a lot of the stuff that was going on I mean, you can actually feel it in the music. It's very positive. It's very optimistic. Well, not all of it. It's not the case with Pink Floyd, for example. At some mm. point, it, mm. st- it started be- being somber, and, and mm. even with Gong, the the, the 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 mood changed a lot. They they went from being very satirical and, and funny to you know, with you, they mm. started being more somewhat not yeah, serious, but... even just a bit darker, you know, and. Mm. Pink Floyd, for example, are very dark in, in the way that they treat stuff and the, yeah. the kind of stuff yeah, that they yeah, treat. Totally. And uh, it's not the only case, of course. Uh, but, you know, it's very important to realise that the importance and the impact that that psychedelic movement has had on, on the old rock and, and general music scene, and it's still going on today. Cause yeah, oh, I, mean, I, I think the most important thing is the the kind of freedom and the the melding of styles, you know, I mean, initially it was, there was a lot of kind of Eastern influence coming in. Yeah, right, you've got to take it in, in context of where it's at. Yeah, exactly, yeah. You know, they don't have, they're not in the position we're in now to look mm. back on it, so we're in the position that we can look back on that and see that massive, giant, global experiment and see, you know, what actually went on, what came out of it, and what came out of it was amazing, which was basically prog rock and a lot of other different things, but, you know, you can say that definitely for us, important for us, yeah. that's what, I mean, what kind of came out of that. Well, like, as a guitarist, you know, Jimi Hendrix is the, just, he broke all the rules, all the boundaries, just threw the whole thing on his head, you know. He Where does Jeff Beck sit into all of this? Uh, well, he was, he, in, well, he was in the Yardbirds initially, Yardbirds, before Clapton. Yeah. And, um, so he's right in there? Yeah, yeah, he was, he was yeah. right in the psychedelic period. Um, what, Clapton's always been much more straight up blues. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Hendrix, kind of the same from from a blues background, but just went completely off off left field with it. Mm. You know? and <coughs> that's what people need to do: a break new ground and kind of. Yeah, and they definitely broke new ground mm. massively, yeah. and that's great. That freedom and everything, and and you can see it in the rebelliousness of the movement at the time. It was like they were, you know, they were really going against the powers that be and the constraints. And also, there's kind of a race thing in America where there was segregation between, you know, black and uh, African American and and white. 
um, and there's like the segregation and it was all you know yeah, yeah, and big deal and it just brought everyone together which was obviously a really important now we just take it for granted but yeah. then yeah. it's a really big deal it was a revolution yeah mm. well it's the 60s revolution and that was one of the the drivers yeah I, I suppose it changed at some point in the way that, that, that it's still going on I mean we're still full of very psychedelic bands like I don't know Tool Radiohead uh, there's so many actually that also are, tentacles are uh, one of the most yeah. most like the 70s in a way yeah. I think and uh, it's just changed and you know back then it was pretty much exclusively mm. about uh, <laughs> the, Pardon? that's difficult to say exclusively about uh, <laughs> LSD and, and yeah um, yeah I mean now you've got DMT you've got <laughs> yeah at some point there that, that was the, the big Ayahuasca and DMT uh, thing exploding pretty much. Uh, for the ones that don't know, uh, ayahuasca is a is a compound that's made by that used to be made and still made by shamans in the in the Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. Forest. Yeah. And it's probably the the most powerful. Well, it, was, it was used by the kind of spiritual leaders of a yeah. of a tribe or a yeah, village. Shamans. Yeah. So the the active ingredient in ayahuasca is something called dimethyltryptamine. Yeah, dimethyltryptamine is is not digestible, so it won't get into the bloodstream. If you if you eat it, you know, as a pure compound, uh, that's an interesting compound. Obviously, dimethyltryptamine. You can go and do your own research. It's a great book called Spirit Spirit Molecule. Um, it's very 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 uh, chemically speaking, very similar to. It's basically almost identical to serotonin, right? Psilocybin. No, I mean the the hormone the, the hormone that that is related to dreaming. Mm -hmm. it's serotonin, serotonin, I think. Serotonin. serotonin, yeah. Yeah. So it's basically yeah, it's something <coughs> that you can find in pretty much every living organism. Mm -hmm. And and ayahuasca, it actually allows that. It's combined with something called mono octo mono something inhibitors, mono octase inhibitors, I think it is. Um, and what they do is they allow that to get through uh, the stomach, go into the blood and go through the uh, blood-brain barrier and then be absorbed by the brain. You can also smoke dimethyltryptamine. Yeah, the I don't know why we're going to this much detail on it, but you know. Yeah, the difference would be that if you take ayahuasca, the process is very long, it's very similar to psilocybin, and it can last up to eight hours, something mm. like that, it's a very mm -hmm. long trip. Uh, whereas if you use DMT, which is, what's the day? Dimethyltryptamine. Yeah, which is the same stuff, crystallized basically, and you smoke it. Uh, the trip is very, very, very fast <coughs> and <coughs> la la lasts very, very short, like 15 minutes. But what you see is supposedly... Well, well nobody you have can to actually explain we, yeah, it. We can't yeah, comment on it. Uh, like, you know, can't. Yeah, it's basically it's called the spirit mo molecule for some reason, I suppose. And since yeah, I, I think I, th I think Terence McKenna puts it as well as anyone can possibly put it. Probably, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he's the he's the guy who who knows, it. and really we probably know so much because we're a fan of his yeah. his work and just what he has said. Really, I mean, yeah, you, you kind of almost just. Um, from listening to his stuff, you just kind of become an expert on oh, all yeah, that stuff, and stuff. But he talks about a lot about of other when it comes to just... psilocybin and, and DMT. Yeah, he's kind well, of, um... bringing it kind of back to music, Sting had a had one experience with ayahuasca in his life when he I, I don't know where where he was somewhere in South America, and <clears throat> with his wife, and he went to a a kind of ceremony where they were they were taking it, and it's actually in his. Um, his autobiography, the, the start of it, he explains his experience. And for, he, he's always said that that was like a massively life-changing mm. um, kind of experience that he went through. He's never done it since, or at all, that's the only time in his entire life. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's so, really something that you need to... Well, of course there's people that, that's been doing it for years and years. But I think it's the kind of experience that if you really experience the, the, the real thing, which is up to you, basically. It, it, it all comes down to the way you do it, if you do it properly. Which is definitely not going around Amsterdam tripping and having fun, you know. And yeah, and, it's not and the way it's supposed to be. The way it's supposed to be, uh, according to Terence McKenna, and trust me, it's the way it's supposed to be, is uh, lying, uh, laying down in a dark place and just letting go of yourself, mm. basically. And the, the main thing about it, 
the main event that you're actually looking for is what they call the death of ego. Ego death. The ego death, mm -hmm. yeah. Which basically means that you... It's like going back to, to an infantile state and, and losing attachment to, to everything that you deem important and, 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 and structural to your life. Everything just disappears in some way and all you can see is what, what you get inside the net. Some people say they, they see God, some people say they, they see the afterlife and some others say that they see the devil and their demons and that, that's the reason why you know you're gonna hear Shadow material. Yeah, you're gonna hear about bad trips all the time. It's because it's Cause they're kinda, bad people. Because it's <laughs> it's a scary very scary experience well, yeah, of course. You're gonna face the thing people treat it should, it should be treated seriously I yeah. think that's the thing this is people the thing that this is exactly the the problem i have with the 60s uh, hippie hippie movement is that it's basically um, this uh, emphasis on everything's great and fun and fantastic and you know really in a way these kind of uh, drugs they open up areas of the brain that that uh, you know buddhist monks or other long term zazen meditators or fourth way practitioners in the Gurdjieff, Gurdjieffian tradition, they work for years, they work for decades to get to that kind of state and they know how serious an endeavor it is. It doesn't come for free. And it's, it's uh, about... Yeah, you know, when when they that attain too. that kind of um, headspace or, or worldview, they're fully prepared for it and it's totally w within them. It's not just some, they're just chucked into it. By, by and there's a the humbleness drug. that comes with that. There's a maturity, mm. and I feel with the 60s, there's a kind of childishness. Yeah, it is. Very, it's very naive. It's like, oh. Well, the whole hippie, trippy kind of, the whole thing is really naive and childish. And that's, why, and that's why, you know, at the end of the day, there was that negativity to it that, you know... Yeah, well, um, no one, I, I don't think anyone really knew what they were doing. Mm. Or, you know, yeah, it was, it was again... All, it was just like a free-for-all. It's easy to say <laughs> this in retrospect, you know. Yeah. But I think ultimately, uh, when you look at any kind of serious spiritual practitioner from you know Zazen tradition for instance they'll be trained and they will take responsibility for their life in a very serious and engaged way where they don't shut themselves off in any way from reality or responsibility and I think that's almost the kind of exact opposite of what, what was going on in the 60s it was like enlightenment for free for a few hours if you take a little thing <laughs> and that's fi fine and good uh, and and I think um, you know, my opinion really is that in relation to to making making music, you know, to expressing yourself, yeah, sure, uh, you know, you could potentially take a substance and have uh, a shift of the ego because you have a completely different experience. So it's difficult. It just draws attention to the fact that you know you your the perception that the 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 witness that that sees is not actually completely uh, connected to the ideas that you have as your ego. So all of that stuff goes away. And then you've got a completely different perspective, and yet that witness is still there. Yeah. So that's why it could could uh, have a big impact. But I think that ultimately, in terms of long-lasting uh, impact, it's of limited use. Maybe it can provide insight, but and this is in relation to making music. And if you really want to express those kinds of, of things, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like yeah, you can do it, but it's kind of like cheating. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I see it. It is in some way. It, uh, well, it depends on the on the route that you take. I think that yeah, doing it unconsciously and, and unaware of what it actually is and what it's supposed to be and the way that you're supposed to use it, it becomes either cheating or even just a, a joke. You know what mm. I mean? And that's why some people are so you know get so scared about it because what what they actually experience is definitely not what they expect. They expect something that's bl bl completely blissful and, and, and joyful and stuff. It's not. Because you're going to see parts of yourself that you don't want to see. Yeah, that, you can't that, avoid that, it. Yeah, that, that's what you called yeah, the shadow material. Exactly. And uh, that's stuff, oh. that, yeah, stuff that your brain is basically trying to, uh, to, to, to hide from you, your life, because you want to remove it because it's painful. And even though it's still very active and influencing your the way you behave and the way you feel about stuff, you you get to actually see it, uh, all of it, all exactly. together at one time. Something that you 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 could that you could find out in ten years of 
psychoanalysis is just bam well, in I your suppose, face. I suppose yeah. you know the thing is about it is if it's, it's not just that it's also bliss. Okay, of course. But the bliss comes bliss, comes but from it, it's cycling, you know. Yeah. The bliss, yeah, it comes from accepting and and, going and actually going through that that shit, mm -hmm. you know. So it's a very difficult uh, process, and it, yeah. it can be a very important ritual, and it can open the doors well, of perception. As, the as problem with it is, is, is but you need to be prepared. That, that, that what I want to say an, is that it's an it should be the other way around. You should thing. get prepared for it first mm -hmm. and experience and have it. Have an intention, not the other way around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, not be a kid and just take it. And, yeah. you know, do something crazy and give it. Well, at least if you want, if you want, if you want to get, if you want to have the the proper effect on yourself and, and take advantage of it. If you mm. just want to have fun and try something weird, you should on. do something else. Or, yeah. or to have, have a or drink. Just, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. But you know, uh, what you said about, um, about uh, repressed emotions and everything, repressed uh, material, it's kind of interesting and worthy of, of thinking about a little bit more because in relation to music, you know, it's the, it's the repression of that kind of stuff and the, the fact that that's not brought into, into, into consciousness. You know, the fact that that's ignored because it, it's a painful memory or comes from a traumatic experience, the fact that, that that's there and repressed, it kind of closes the mind down, closes the brain down. And, and that's why <coughs> so psychedelics and other drugs, the psychoactive compounds, could be useful in making music, maybe to make a breakthrough in that area. Yeah. But, you know... Um, they're not in any way necessary. No, they're not in any way necessary. <laughs> I think the thing is you can do that through... Especially because you can have the, the psychedelic. First of all, psychedelic means manifest in the mind, manifestation of the mind. And you can have that kind of experience with different practices. You don't necessarily mean, yeah, you don't necessarily mean use, uh, need to use uh, compounds that, that, that inhibits yeah. your, your... Well, I mean, effectively what they're doing is putting mm -hmm. your brain into a state that you, you can put your brain into naturally, because it's just a, a chemical shift, mm -hmm. effectively, which is possible to do just through Exactly. Training your mind. And, and the thing is that, that really you have all these groups and the, and the serious practitioners in various different traditions, They what they do is they try to open up into that shadow material and shine the light of consciousness. I mean, what, you know, when you do meditative practices where you basically keep your attention there, inevitably some stuff's going to happen where you're like, uh, you know, yeah. I don't like that. And then your consciousness will disappear and you'll kind of notice that you're not as aware as otherwise, and there's a reason for that, which is that you know you don't you don't want to face up to the material that's arising in your awareness at that time. Yeah, Robert Anton Wilson had this very interesting. Let's call it theory. It's not a theory. It's a view. Uh, he used to call it uh, tunnels of reality. Yeah, reality tunnels. He's a really good writer. Uh, you know, guy. Yeah. Was. By the way, may he rest in peace. Uh, by the way, there's so much from there's so much influence from Robert Anton Wilson, Terence McKenna, Al Watts, Ken Wilber, mm -hmm. and uh, the even the Buddhist tradition, the, the yeah. Hinduist tradition, in our new album, mm -hmm. uh, there's quite a lot of it. The, all this stuff, this is very important to us because it's been influencing us. And, and the, the, it, it says a lot about, you know, Alan Watts was writing books and, and talking about this stuff 40 years ago. Uh, he's still influencing people because he's been, he's still influencing me, for example, today in 2015. So that's the, the, the greatness of that kind of, of influence. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? <laughs> I haven't got it. I think you said what you were going to yeah, say. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but no, anyway, I agree. Alan Watts is, is, is incredible. Ah, Robert Anton Wilson, yeah, the ton of reality. Oh, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's yeah. like having a, an imprint of a particular worldview or a. Yeah, because of course we are subject to billions and billions and billions of inputs all the time from all, over, uh, all around us. You know, our brain. Is being bombarded by the fucking universe all the time. Data. All, yeah, yeah, data all the fucking time. We the fucking universe. Billions and billions of, <laughs> of, 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 of inputs from, from everything our senses get, would get overwhelmed. Our brain would be overwhelmed mm. if we didn't filter stuff. And create our own little. Yeah, so stuff. we need to create our little tunnel of mm. view and sensing. Otherwise, we, we go mad. And what happens pretty much when you <coughs> when you <Barrett. coughs> yeah when you use psilocybin, for example, is that that filter goes down, and you just find yourself in touch with everything right away at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
So bam. <laughs> you know, you yeah, actually see what's and ready or not. Yeah, and everything that you think it's important now, like you know, your family, your girlfriend, your kids, your job, everything yeah, just fucking right. disappears. You don't I give a shit the, about anything anymore. I everything is the, so fucking the, distant. One of the best kind of written pieces on that is Aldous Huxley's um, Doors of Perception yeah, and Heaven and Hell. Really nice. The, the, yeah, the two way that he goes because, through it. Well, the, it's because he's such an eloquent intellectual academic. Mm -hmm. And it's his, about masculine, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. So. And his, it's the way he, uh, he kind of expresses it. It's mm -hmm. from such an objective, detached point of view that he comes at it from, mm -hmm. um, and just very open and uh, very aware. Yeah, well, by the way, well worth reading. Yeah, we're definitely. talking about a guy that actually understood the way that the world should be. I think it was one of the greatest geniuses of, of, of all time. Yeah. And if you haven't, you should read a book called Island, mm. in which basically he's going to explain to you how the world is, should be if we want it to be happy and, and, and produ productive and, and functional. That's Genius. the whole point. Yeah. You know, I wanted to As come back on, on something that um, I think we might have to kind of... Well, I wanted to go back on, on, uh, on Ken Wilber. Uh, he says something interesting, which is that people who kind of rely on um, psychedelics, uh, they, you know, for their spiritual practice, they end up having this dependence and this kind of effect where they don't quite fully integrate into their lives the, the general feeling or, or be actually living that. They kind of depend on it too much and it's a temporary thing. Yeah. In relation to, I think it's important though that we touch on this in relation to what it actually means uh, for for creating music, because obviously creating music comes from a creative space. You've got to be creative, have parts of your brain op uh, open, or opening the brain is obviously incredibly important. And being in a in an open state of mind, and I suppose you know in a certain context, or in certain situations, that might be helped through the use of. Um, psychoactive substances for certain people maybe probably as uh, as almost proven by that uh, psychedelic movement in the 60s mm -hmm. but um you know there are there are other ways to do it you know like uh, robert fripp with his uh, his his um kind of practice of the fourth way and, and all that kind of thing um you know i don't know what the what the um what the alter whether you can actually ultimately class it as something that's Dependable. Well, as it's well. All, it's, what it all boils down to is awareness. That's the uh, that's the key. It's getting to awareness. Mm. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. It's being aware. That's the uh, that's the important thing. Yeah, and if psychedelics help you to do that and go right yeah, ahead. As we were saying, that well, is... no, not that we recommend it, <laughs> seeing as they're highly well, but illegal. But you know, <laughs> that might, that might help. It's, it's kind that. of pointless because it's a temporary, transitory. Thing. If you take a drug to get to that state, you're only in that state while you're under the effect of that drug. So it's, it's Much a transitory, better. temporary state. Much better to practice Zazen or Fourth Way. Indeed. So now we're going to talk about um, an album which was a big part of the kind of psychedelic movement um, by a band called Gong, who are kind of part French, part British. Um, Australian. Uh, yeah. Australian, yeah. Yeah, true. Yeah, let's not forget Australian, <laughs> the front man. Um, uh, the album we're going to specifically talk about is an album called You, which is the third part of a trilogy of the Radio Gnome Invisible trilogy, which starred with the Flying Teapot, then Angel Egg, and finally You. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, who wants to start? Yeah, I think okay, that, I think it's a of... concept. I'm gonna just gonna yeah, explain go the concept very briefly. The, yeah. the, the, Three albums explain, um, tell the concept, the story of, of, a, of a character called Zero. And the guy basically is a, is a space traveler. He gets lost and he finds, yeah, I know, it's that weird. <laughs> and, uh, it's even finds, more weird. Yeah, he finds uh, a planet in which there are uh, some people called uh, the Pothead. Uh, pixies, 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 yeah, altered doctors, yeah, all this kind of uh, these weird characters. <laughs> the knows. And basically, the the guy is wondering about the, the meaning of life and the meaning of, of what living is, uh, physically, and uh, he starts having le lectures by by and, and hints by these these guys that he meets. And this is what happens in in the first album. In the second album, he just kind of realizes, which is Angel's Egg, 
x, he kind of realizes that it's pointless to 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 wonder to to, to ask himself questions about what being actually means. And in the third album, which is the one that we're going to talk about, which is you, he kind of goes back to wondering about the meaning of life, and he, he gets these responses from from yeah this pothead uh, pixies, and uh, this do this octave doctors. whatever <laughs> if they are. Yeah, just can't remember the name of that stuff. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what it is about. And yeah, that's yeah. it. So well, musically, it's um, it's pretty mental. It's kind of like a. It reminds me of a um, like a Disney film gone horribly wrong, and just just <laughs> well, maybe really gone horribly good. right. Well, maybe yeah. horribly right. Yeah, maybe. Just horribly just psychedelic. Horribly something. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. very odd, and kind of <laughs> musically, it's very varied. And there's a lot of sort of jazz influence in it. Yeah, whenever they're sort of singing, it's very, very hippie folky in a way. Um, and all these kind of bizarre, stupid voices. Space voices. whispers. Space whispers. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's very creative. It's the best way of putting it. It's very creative. It's uh, Jilly or Gilly? Jilly yeah, Smith? Yeah. Gilly? Gilly okay. Smith? Yeah. Um, she was the partner of uh, David Allen, who was uh, the front man and kind of uh, was well, the, the guitarist and the singer of. He was uh, the no, he was the guitarist, the founder of. Okay. of yeah, also I think he used to, to, to sing. Mm -hmm. He was the founder of the band. He came from Australia to to the UK. Then got uh, he had a visa problem, couldn't get back to, to, to the UK. To so France. he had to yeah and to move found, to France. Allegedly found their saxophonist living in a cave in France. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which no, is the kind of shit you're dealing with. They're Plutist. No, no, it was their saxophonist. It was in New Yorker, actually. Maybe it wasn't. No, it was in France. You yeah. sure? Yeah, no, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is the story. He went from... He, he was working in, in a bookstore in Australia, okay? Yeah. He read about uh, William Burrow, Burroughs. So he goes to, to the UK. And... Yeah. And... Then he moves to France for the, there was some 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 riots going on, some student riots going on, and, and he took part in it. Then he tried to go back to to UK, he couldn't get in the UK because he, he had a visa problem, so he had to go back to France, where he met his his his, his wife. Yeah, she was a she was an professor. English professor in in France. He's got three degrees from King's yeah. College. Hasn't he? And uh, yeah, he formed the first formation of, of the band there. Three degrees from King's College. And then they... <laughs> he does space yeah. I think then they, 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 had to, they, they got busted by police. I what think. a surprise! <laughs> <laughs> and they had to move to Spain, actually. I think it's, I think it's in Spain that they, they found the guy in the cave. Oh, yeah, pretty yeah sure. right. Was Mallorca. That? Oh, maybe it It's was. where Banana Mallorca, Mallorca, Observatory yeah. was. Oh, yeah. Okay. Which is like Deo. So, yeah, the band, uh, they, they went through a lot of transformations. And, by the way, Alan was, was also... in in Soft Machine before death. He was a founding member oh. of Soft Machine, yeah. and this is an important point. He he was a founding member of Soft Machine in 1966, uh, no, yes, no, 66, with Kevin Ayers in Canterbury, and there was this whole thing in the Canterbury scene where you got Kevin Ayers, a guy called uh, Robert Wyatt, and uh, David Allen, and they kind of formed, you know, they were playing in lots of different bands together. There's a lot of others, Steve Hillage, um, who was the guitarist who joined Gong. Like, uh, um, Actually, he played on the first Radio Gnome <coughs> trilogy album. Yeah, uh, and rejoined them later because they've had various... Yeah, you should see how many people have come and left. I've seen Steve anyway, Hillage live, actually, at Bastonbury. So, very good. so they, f they formed Soft Machine, uh, and then, uh, for whatever reason, David Allen left the UK, went to France, and then he tried to get back in the UK. He's Australian. His visa... Was I just said this I stuff. know, but it was in 67. Okay. And then... Um, so he was forced to go to, back to Paris... That's where he met Gilly yeah. Smith, who uh, was his remember. wife, yeah. and um, and they formed Gong in '67, and then they released Flying Teapot. And another interesting thing, they were one of the first bands to sign to Virgin Records. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they released a few albums before they signed to Virgin Records, but the Radio Gnome trilogy, starting with Flying Teapot, and ending with You, which is the album I'm actually talking about. And that was over a very short period of time. Those three albums, what, mm -hmm. like yeah, it was like uh, two years. years? Oh. You was nineteen seventy four. I think it was like sixty four, sixty um sixty seven, sixty nine. No, no, no. You no, was seventy four. Seventy four. Uh, <clears throat> um, <coughs> Angels 
Angel Egg mm -hmm. was Angel Egg, yeah. 73, I think. No, you is the last one. Yes, mm. and that, that was seventy four. Time, okay, and then and then you know um, how numbers work. Flying <laughs> T, but I think it was seventy one. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. they signed. They were one of the oh, no seventy. No, sorry, Angel Egg is seventy three. No, Are you okay, sure? Doesn't matter. Like, Seventy three, right? We, have, the, we have no fucking no, idea what we're no, talking about. We, we do, we do. <laughs> right, right. Virgin was Virgin Records was formed in seventy two. Uh -huh. Okay, they released. Yeah, they basically um, put these three albums out within three years. I think. Yes, that's right. I think that's the easiest way and, of saying it. But but basically, they were one of the first. The important thing is they were one of the first bands on Virgin Records, mm -hmm. which obviously are massive now. But yeah. at the time, it was like a little yeah, yeah. record shop. Then uh, at the same time, it was like Mike Oldfield who was who was doing Tube of the Bells. That's what really made their, their name. It was really successful. But you know, Gong were right in there at that time with these mm. three. These three. They albums. were just a little bit too mental. <laughs> 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 they just wouldn't stop going on about the radio gnomes and mm. <laughs> octave doctors. Um, so, actually, to tie into that, um, these albums were actually recorded in the Manor House Studios, which is where uh, a lot of the stuff that, that went on with the radio uh, Virgin Records. Yeah were recorded and everything and the the guy who was engineering and co-producing is a guy called Simon Hayworth and he um he obviously was involved in Mike Oldfield, Jubilee Bells and a lot of other things, you know, after that. Um very, very important guy in uh in music in general because you know especially in that prog uh sort of mm -hmm. psychedelic rock prog rock uh, realm. Anyway, go on our very good good example of a sagrada band especially under the influence of Allen, because they actually used to use a lot of it of LSD and other. Well, they used to take and, LSD together as yeah, a band. Yeah, at some point, um, yeah, they started taking it all together, and then, and, and, and then that's actually one of the reasons they, part of the reasons why they they kind of dissolved is because there was a, a, kind of split within the band as to whether it was actually very wise to be taking drugs all the time. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and you was the last album that David Allen yeah. was in the band in that in that incarnation at that time. Yeah. He left afterwards for the reasons that you said. And actually Steve Hillage was one of the guys who who David Allen because they have a rule in Gong where they say you can't leave the band unless you find a replacement for yourself, which I love. And he found Steve Hillage who was another guy from Canterbury. Yeah, because Canterbury Gong scene. also is spreads out as as there's this uh, the Gong website. It's like a big family like Man, a it's tribe. amazing. The yeah. Gong, the Gong universe Community, is just yeah. incredible. The yeah. mythology of Gong and everything. Yeah. It's really deep. It's really yeah. good. Yeah, in their stuff, there's a lot of reference to Egyptian mythology and Buddhist mm -hmm. mythology, especially mm -hmm. in this album. You, even though you know uh, that. Well, there was a lot of political satire involved also, yeah. as well. The point is that they they went from flying teapot being very, very funny in some way, very not very serious and stuff, and it changed during time and basically you was way more he, he took itself more seriously in some way especially because the other musicians apart from Allen I mean it's probably their influence wanted to move yeah towards something more serious and, and he was still trying to be silly well I think yeah. I think you was actually the the only one of the three that they really wrote as a band before it was much more you know David Allen yeah. present it was pretty stuff. much him so yeah, yeah. But the then he just that... got tired of, of what they wanted to become, basically. And that's what happened to Soft Machine too, pretty much. The, the art musicians wanted to, to move towards different areas, more Some less psychedelic and, and more technical, academical stuff. Mm. And basically when, when the, the, the visionary left, mm. what, what happened to the bands is that they, they, they transformed into this more sterile, even though mm. very, very good, you know, mm. musically, mm. crafting, talking but more sterile and less less fantasy, less creativity in some way. A couple, I've got a couple of important things to say. One is that the whole Gong mythology and everything that is Gong, the band, and everything that David Allen was trying to do, came to him in a vision in 1966, in, uh, when he it was at a full moon in 66, and he had this vision of himself on a stage, and you know, basically uh, that's when the whole thing came together. And ever since then, he was trying to actually put that into practice and make that a reality. And also, David Allen, very sadly, uh, died last month, actually. Yeah. Um, and I mean, he, he's a genius. He was a genius, that guy. Mm. Um, I really think that, and one thing that he said that I really, really made me understand Gong, was that um, basically they, 
uh, he used comedy. He recognised. He said he recognised quite early on that comedy is a way to to hide, to cover over the human imperfections, so that he could transmit the serious message that he had to give. You know about whatever he was trying to say in his crazy stories about you know uh, kind of transcendence and and you know whatever else it was. That's yeah, it was pretty similar to Frank Zappa in some ways, especially in this album. There's there's a couple of tracks, especially the second one. Uh, which is called, uh, I think it's called A Suggestion by uh, one of those guys. What are they called? The Octave Doctors? The Octave Doctors. No, the other ones. Pixie Potheads. Yeah, exactly. Pothead Pixies. <laughs> uh, which is pretty much a very Zappian song. It's yeah, like this, yeah. this very cool and, and, and funny music. They dun 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 With him talking. What it, 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 yeah, what the fuck. It really sounds like, like a Zappa thing. Yeah, but you know, actually, in the in the whole feel of the album, this is something that we don't have so much nowadays. And you can really feel this in the psychedelic movement. The whole feel of the album is really, in my opinion, it's quite upbeat. It's like, do, do. Yeah, yeah, do, it's do, very do, happy. Do. Yeah, it's kind of best it's, it's, happiness, yeah. It's really, it's a, such a fun album to listen to. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. It's really enjoyable, like, just in a really, at a really primordial level. That it's just, it doesn't take itself seriously, really, and it's just kind yeah. of a bit silly, but also... It really also gets very very deep in, in, in the later songs, and, and of course it's very good under, uh, from a technical perspective. Yeah. Mm. The, the rhythmical session is amazing. Well, it's very... It, it reminds me a lot of Zappa's kind of writing, yes, with all right. these little... Um, That's what he just said. I just said... <laughs> oh, sorry, I was busy, I was busy <laughs> changing, changing a camera. Mm -hmm. But well, yeah, all great. those kind of complex little twiddly lines yeah. that just appear once, just joining stuff mm -hmm. together. And, and everything is kept together by the, the rhythmical session. And mm. this, this very... You know, this is something very uh, related to, to the psych psychedelic thing. This, for example, in the bass, uh, pretty much psychedelic... A psychedelic vision and, and experience is pretty much based on patterns, okay? Patterns of, of especially with LSD, you, you, you can go through these cycles, these loops, as they call, call them. And uh, in psychedelic music, especially in other tentacles, for example, you get this pattern in in the bass and the and the drums a lot. Yes. With yeah, all yeah. this do 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 do. Yeah, right, right, right. Listen, listen to a track by Osric Tentacles called Jurassic Shit. Yeah, it's fucking amazing. Yeah, it's all the yeah the bass and the and the drums they keep up this pattern that goes on and on. It's very deep. It it creates a structure and a focus for for the other stuff to to play around with. Yeah, yeah, right. And you know, actually, I think there's some really the point is that it's kind of a silly album, you and all, a lot of gong stuff, in a way. But it's very it's serious in other ways. Serious yeah. kind of uh, technique and everything. And, yeah. and also that's why meetings. David Allen left because I think David Allen's a bit of a, a bit of a kind of or a joker in some way. Yeah. Yeah. He's he he's, he doesn't really like being deadly serious. Yeah. He wants to be kind of a comedian. That's interesting. When he left, I, I I was never really a massive fan of anything that came after you. Yeah. I think that was really their their pinnacle. I think yeah. you as it's, if you want to really listen to quintessential gong, that was their pinnacle. Oh, yeah. That was their. Well, for me, it's their magnum mag opus. But Radio Gnome Trilogy in its entirety is genius. Mm. There's actually a U remixed album. Yeah, Phase and One and Phase Two, yeah. which other people remixed them. It's, I don't know. It's it's strange. They basically every song just gets drawn out by about another. Mm -hmm. Six minutes. <laughs> they have a very, they have a very hardcore following. Go yeah, on. yeah, they do. Yeah. Their following is amazing. They're a serious cult band, really, aren't they? Yeah, they really they never are. really achieved any most kind of people who would, success. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> very few people would would uh, know of Gong really, and, and but they're such an important band. The fact that it's a founding member of Soft Machine and that that all this stuff really gave rise to the prog rock movement. You know, yeah. Yes, Caravan. Whoever else in the Canterbury scene and everything, and they were really in there, and yet they just were a little bit too too mental, too trippy <laughs> too to too ever really break into the mainstream. But geniuses. Well, it's one of those things that's kind of um, like up, up towards this doing this vlog. We've all been listening to it a lot, probably more than we should, because <laughs> 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 um, it is it's one of those sorts of albums that you kind of have to be in the right frame of mind or or kind of want to listen to because it's very bizarre and it's 
it's not the kind of thing you want to force yourself to listen to, is it? Mm. But I always find that I never really have to make an effort to listen to it. I think it's so, for me, it's so light-hearted. Well, yeah, yeah, but, well, in a, it is and it isn't. It's kind of, whenever there's vocals and singing elements, that's when it becomes really light-hearted and kind of, that's where the kind of fun sort of element Jovial. Into, yeah. But some of the kind of extended instrumental bits, they're a lot, a lot kind of deeper and... Yeah, mm -hmm. but also in the lyrics, it, it, even though it's it, it, it seems to be yeah, it seems to be light, silly. It's not it's at all. Not at all. It's yeah, very yeah, serious yeah, in, yeah. in the things that it, it talks about. It's very mm -hmm. deep. It's just the way they present it. Yeah, it's and once lyrics. you start to 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 bring the pieces together and to realize that you know the, the, the where that stuff is coming from, there's so much Buddhism, for example, in it. Uh, there's actually proper. You know, it talks about an inner temple. It talks about uh, Maya. As, illu yeah. as illusion, mm -hmm. and uh, that there's actually a, a, a om moment, and it's a really good one. And it's yeah, very it's cool. Really good. Yeah. It's very good. Om. Um, yeah. <laughs> Something that you're gonna find in our album too, by the way. Just a little spoiler our coming out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, because all this stuff's got, at least for me, but for all of us, a lot of influence. A lot of influence. We are basically the new psychedelic scene, you know, and so we we're part of it. Like we, I think it all started. The, this new psychedelic thing started with Tool in some way, mm. and and you know. I think that they're just a continue. I think the thing is the psychedelic is because it, it's. If, if you, I think it's where connect. it makes with esoterical stuff and more yeah. awareness, consciousness, and, and actual technique about uh, going inside yourself and 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 finding. Mm -hmm. Out about you know yes, not just shadow material, material. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's not uh, recreational anymore mm -hmm. it, it's been more let's do something serious about ourselves pretty much you know and yeah we're part of that pretty I much. think we're I think we're absolutely in that in that thread yeah. there where yeah. you got no no psychedelic bands or blues going psychedelic going prog rock going kind of turning into into metal with Opeth, well not Opeth, but, you know, they're later obviously. Mm. But um, you know, you've got all of that movement there through grunge and through rock and everything and, and really it's a continuation of prog. That's what I, I feel that, yeah. that we're doing. There's quite a lot of bands that, that are in the, in this area with us. Uh, Gojira come to mind. Uh, Carnival come to mm -hmm. mind. Uh, Soen comes to mind. And uh, sometimes you get critiqued for it, uh, you know, every now and then I read some comments on YouTube. On, on, well, the, on fun, the funny thing I got was the way I actually found out about Carnival was that someone said we sat, we were a Carnival rip-off and I'd never even heard them before. <laughs> and, and I was like, okay, I'd better check this band out. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and they're uh, amazing. Yeah, so we obviously ripped them off without actually hearing them. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's weird. But it's I was weird. really happy that that happened because they're really but it's fucking just a good band. It's just a matter of shared uh, conscien consciousness in some way. It's just yeah. a, a lot of people at some where, point have a breakthrough. You know what I mean? What it oh. is is it's where you come from. Where you come from in terms of your music. The, the kind of the way I look at it is you're trying to project a, a particular feeling or mind state. That's the that's what I'm always trying to do is come from this very specific location. The point is um, that you, you put yourself into your music, okay? So if your only interest is, like in our case, for example, philosophy and, and meditation and, and techniques of, of, of awareness develop, development and integral development in all its uh, lights, of course you're gonna turn that stuff into your music, you know, it's just obvious. So it's not it's not something that you do because you want to do it because you you think it's cool. It's not an effort. You're just expressing yourself, and if well, you are that, exactly. you know, you just express that. Well, the the whole point behind art is it's inherently totally selfish. It's um, when you create art, be it music or painting or or in writing, it's a completely selfish act. It's you do it entirely for yourself. You're not thinking about anyone else. Where any kind of artist in any in any media kind of goes wrong is where they um they try and write something that will be liked or is for a specific group of people or whatever you know that's that's doing it the wrong way that's the difference between being an artist and being uh, being a, a whore 
I think that's, abso- <laughs> I think that's abso- what you said is absolutely true in terms of you know when when you come to write music you can't con- you can't come up with an idea and then just create it you know that's when you get those overproduced bands that it's like it's way it's really contrived that's but at the same time <coughs> back. <laughs> hey look they made some Ooh. good stuff right CLA might be responsible, Chris Aldalgy. Yeah, and the only good thing about them is the production. CLA, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, he's a genius. Chris Aldalgy, by the way, is a genius. A man. Not that he needs any more promotion, but... <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, we think he is. So, you know, I think the thing is, though, that ultimately, for me, it's kind of getting myself out, and I think for all of us, really, it's a matter of getting yourself out of out of the picture as much as you can. You know, so you are writing the music for yourself, but at the same time, you're not. It's not like you're, yeah, you're sitting right. there going, "I'm going to do this and this and this for me." You yeah, know, I think the point is that you're, you're, the the area we're trying to write from is that egoless state. Mm. So that's the point. It's kind of yeah. Yeah, and uh, and I think that ultimately, yeah, you can't really do that for for anyone else. Um. It's kind, of, it's kind of a... a We've kind of gone, off, gone off the subject of gone here. <laughs> quite, quite severely. Quite drastically, yeah, yeah, but it was bound to happen. You know, they're that kind of band. <laughs> um, so are there any uh, band updates that we want to give? we got anything to say? Band-wise? Um, I've got Shark. I don't think we said that on the 24th... Did we say it in yeah, our we'll, last vlog? Yeah, we'll say it again, mate. Okay. We're going to release a video on the 24th of the... First, First song, song on the album, which is called "Waving This for Emphasis." Can I say it? You're gonna rec- you're gonna give the name of the track away. Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Just to add something to to add, you know what I mean? Why not? The the song is called Fish. Logos. Fuck. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> it's called Logos, and it's the the first song in our new album, Logocharia. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much. So it. we basically recorded a video. We recorded ourselves. Don't give it away video. completely. We all fuck's sake. We, yeah. we, uh, you can piece it together. Okay. You know, if you're allowed to do that, I'm allowed to do <laughs> okay. no, no one watches these videos anyway. <laughs> Some people do. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're probably not going to get this far because we're approaching an hour now. Yeah. Well, you know. Um, <laughs> anyway, seeing as we've gone that far, we may as well finish. <laughs> uh, so we basically recorded ourselves when when we recorded that track. Um, you know, in the studio, we're actually recording the, the, the live takes, and now we've got we've basically put all of that stuff together into a into a video, or we are putting it together, and that's going to come out on the twenty fourth, and we're really happy with it. Yeah, yeah it's cool. really good. It's good. Well, it's good. We like it. It's not like you know, maybe they think it's shit. We'll yeah, we'll we we'll keep see. saying that everything's cool, it sounds cool, it looks cool. Yeah, you know, maybe you fucking hate it. And you think it's shit. <laughs> In which so, case you shouldn't be watching us, this. It's good. We like we pretty much like it, you know. <laughs> and if you do yeah. hate it, it's fine. It's good for you. That's fine. That's good. I don't care. Really. <laughs> Go listen to Gong. <laughs> Go selfish. listen to Gong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, listen to Gong, it's better. Okay, I think we're done with this. Yeah. Yeah. We don't actually know what our next vlog is about. At this point, so why? Of course we do. Next yeah. week. Do you know what it is then? Uh, uh, what day is it today? Eleventh. Yeah. Eighteenth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but what? What's the subject? I don't remember. Who gives a shit? We gotta make it up yeah. on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> we do actually have. We do have actually have them planned. Yeah. But we just can't remember. <laughs> we just forgot it. Anyway, that's all for our vlog number seven. We hope it was entertaining for you <laughs> as much as it was for us. See you next time. Goodbye from Isarus. Thank you. Goodbye.